Welcome everyone to uh, Discovering the Architecture Middle Part pod- podcast. Uh, so during the last episode, we discussed about uh, services, small services, medium services, and uh, large services. Uh, so uh, we thought of continue that discussion and get into uh, something related to that. Uh, so Sanjeeva, I was uh, on the road uh, during last two weeks and met a number of people in uh, some enterprises, as well as I went to developer week uh, and met a bunch of uh, developers and architects uh, in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Then what I figured, uh, there's still uh, uh, confusion in between APIs and services and a lot of debate and dialogue about uh, this topic as well. Uh, so um, I thought that might be a really good uh, topic for us to discover today. Yeah, sounds good. I, I think uh, I completely agree with you. There's a lot of confusion about what is an API versus, versus a service and what goes in an API, how do you manage lifecycle, all kinds of things about services so, and APIs. So, yeah, let's dig into it. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, uh, first thing we can take a look at... Uh, uh, what's a service and what's an API. Uh, so um, in very high level, uh, uh, API is the interface and the service is the implementation. So the important part of an API for me is the I, which is the interface. And in fact, the concept of an API is not new. It's been around since the uh, early days of modern operating systems where it was the way in which our application programming interface is how the applications interacted with the system. That's why it's called an application programming interface versus a system call interface. And um, the, the APIs, uh, the power of API comes from the quality of the interface and where you know what it's going to do by reading the documentation, by you know what the inputs have to be, you know what you're going to get, you know what errors can happen and you just use it and magic happens and of course what the web services era has brought uh, or the distributed computing era or the modern distributed computing era has brought is this api concept brought over to the internet scale uh, execution and of course we had remote procedure calls which were invented in the late 80s which was for distributed computing same same kind of thing and interface description languages but they were focused on much more local network distributed interactions versus internet scale distributed interactions. So now when you are dealing with internet scale application programming interfaces or APIs, the I part becomes, the the quality of the interface becomes even more important because you don't know who's using it and the person using it might be, they might be using something that they wrote something using your capabilities and they've been using it happily for years. So the ability to change, ability to manage expectations, all of that is dramatically different for that. Whereas a service in my, you know, in our our parlance, service is a thing that provides the capability. API is how you access the capability or you expose the capability, depending on which way you look at the the interface from. Yeah, I I think uh, it's very interesting because even I used to do a lot of... uh, a programming using DCOM, COM, and COBA even. And I can remember one COBA interface and uh, to communicate in between two C++ programs, it took more than a week for me to figure it out. Uh, so it wasn't uh, that easy. So the interface itself was very complicated and the way we communicated. Uh, and I think the, the uh, another thing that happened, I think around 2011, 2012 time frame. Uh, introducing this uh, business or managed APIs, right? So that uh, kind of changed yeah. the concept of the uh, uh, technical API into a more uh, reusable, discoverable, and uh, carries a business value out of it and then uh, managed by the uh, organization rather than letting everybody to just create these uh, uh, interfaces and then uh, ask uh, to communicate. And I think uh, uh, that that was a, a game change and that's where all these uh, new concepts came into the picture. Uh, so um, that's one thing 
I think uh, the developers and architects uh, don't understand the difference between this uh, technical API or a service endpoint versus this managed uh, uh, APIs that we are dealing uh, today. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. The, the, the business API or, or the, the managed endpoint uh, is really what you are exposing to somebody else. And the other one is the internal implementation details, right? So it's very much like in some sense object orientation. Uh, it's sort of like object orientation was supposed to hide implementation details and give you a contract with which you can interact with that object. Uh, and services and APIs are kind of that level of split where you can say, well, I have an API and, and that experience in is designed and governed and managed from the from from a sort of a business perspective and by business I don't mean you know finance and uh, um, uh, sort of revenue kind of aspects but business in, in the sense of capabilities of what you're trying to expose and what you're trying to deliver as a service versus how am I implementing it what are the details of of that aspects so yeah I think it is very important to understand the difference between the two one is that's why API design matters because you need to separate the problem of designing the API from how in the world am I going to get it working and implemented and deployed and managed and all of that stuff. Exactly. I think that's the key. And when it comes to this API first designs and API first approach, uh, that's what we have to think uh, as well as understand the uh, application requirements, application developer needs. Uh, and then design the APIs rather than we just uh, expose something based on the uh, uh, technical knowledge and the uh, uh, capabilities that we have in the back end. Uh, so the, the um, uh, and, and I think uh, if someone or organization get this model right, they get a lot of advantages. So one advantage I see the separating these two now uh, API will have a separate life cycle and the service will have a separate life cycle. So that means API will have a different version as well as a, a service or number of services that create that particular API will have a, a separate life cycle and definitely we have to manage the dependencies. But uh, that way uh, the we can do more innovation at the service level because we can keep on improving the capabilities and functionality so it can be a performance related thing or it can be more kind of business functionality related thing and as long as we don't break the contract we have provided in the API uh, we get that flexibility and uh, I see that as a huge advantage we are getting by considering the uh, rapid uh, business requirement changes as well as the demand coming from the application development groups. Yeah, and another way to look at that is actually if you look at the versioning strategy. So, uh, you know, today we are kind of uh, in many software systems, we use semantic versioning as a good disciplined way of managing versions, right? Major minor patch, major meaning, hey, if you change a major version, there are no there are no uh, you know, limits to what might have changed. You kind of have to expect to change your code to depend on a new major version. Minor means it's supposed to be upward compatible. So there may be new stuff you can use, but old stuff continues to work. Patch means you don't need to worry about any changes, some internal operational change, right? Uh, but if you look at from a, 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 and that model works very well for service version. But then if you look at API versioning, um, typically, if you look at APIs offered by public endpoints, uh, large-scale public endpoints, say Twilio or Salesforce or something like that, they don't usually deal with minor versions uh, differences as a version number that you need to be aware of. Primary reason being it is upwardly compatible. So why do you need to be aware of it? The only thing you as a consuming developer need to be aware, aware of is, hey, there may be some new functionality I can use, right? Beyond that, I don't need to know whether it is now 1.3 or 1.37. It makes no difference to me. Right? There's some more stuff. I can use it if I'm interested. And so, so it becomes a marketing and communication 
requirement for the developer of the API or the publisher of the API to get that information across to their consuming developers to say, hey, I have more stuff, but it's up to you. You can use it. You don't have to use it. Right? Or if you run a major change, like I think Salesforce went from uh, Salesforce version 3 to version 4 API. I think uh, Twitter has Twitter version 1, Twitter version 2 API. Then it's really two major versions. Right? And, and you developer have to choose, am I going to use one or am I going to use two? Exactly. So I, I think that's another important difference that you have to uh, you have to get. And of course, while version 1.1 is uh, being used uh, and version 1.2 has been put up and so on, underneath you might have found a memory leak, you might have found a bug, you might have found a security hole, and you're fixing away. Right? No capability change, underlying system is evolving. Exactly. And that's, so separation of the API and the service in the head really is important from that aspect. Yeah, and I think these uh, some development teams like religiously following microservice type of patterns, they think bringing APIs is the overhead. But I think by considering all these advantages that we are getting from technical point of view as well as uh, from the business point of view, uh, it is simplifying the stuff as well as uh, bringing more agility as well as the increasing the composability or the reuse of these uh, capabilities and make it easier for uh, the both development teams like uh, the backend development teams as well as the um, application development teams. And I think another thing that we can take a look at uh, how we can enhance the uh, uh, the APIs. Uh, so one way of uh, doing that is uh, categorizing them based on the purpose. Uh, I think there are many ways of uh, doing that, but uh, one thing that uh, we follow as well as uh, uh, recommending our customers uh, basically uh, use domain APIs, um, experience APIs, and sometimes uh, these utility uh, APIs are coming and playing a picture. And the domain APIs are the uh, the business uh, uh, logic that we uh, keep inside these services and then expose those capabilities. It can be coming from a, a data source or it can be some compute. And, and in some cases, uh, the domain API as it is might not be um, uh, friendly to use in the application development. So that's where the experience APIs are coming that uh, we uh, enhance the capabilities of domain APIs and uh, putting it as experience APIs. But that doesn't mean that application cannot directly call a domain API. It can, uh, but uh, whenever it requires, uh, we can introduce uh, experience API. I think this uh, concept of uh, uh, backend pro front end is a good example or BFFs. Uh, and the, the, the last uh, the category that I explained about utility APIs, uh, because sometimes there can be APIs not directly linked to a business function. As example, a notification like a SMS uh, uh, notification or an email notification that we have to send that might be shared across uh, multiple teams uh, that can easily uh, categorize as a utility API as well. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think... Uh... Uh, if you're running an API program in a business, you need to have some structure and some uh, organization for the capabilities. And this model, uh, this domain APIs, experience APIs, and utility APIs is a very convenient model. Uh, I think it's been practiced, uh, similar uh, concepts have been practiced by uh, many companies. Uh, I think Mule, uh, Mule is one of the companies that pioneered this style of uh, naming, uh, yeah. organizing things. So, so that's great. Uh, so it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's conceptual uh, sanity, basically. Right? Uh, so that, that also naturally leads to the question about uh, how you manage exposure. You know, sometimes you want to give APIs within the business. Sometimes you want to give APIs to outside the business, maybe to partners, maybe to consuming developers. Um, and then also uh, the other side is important. You know, the whole point of, giving APIs to somebody is that somebody else can use it. So similarly, you are going to use your APIs. So if you look at WC2, for example, we don't, uh, we run the company completely on a set of SaaS services. Uh, that means we, whenever we have some 
APIs we implement or some application we implement, we are calling external APIs. And, and so, so all services then end up becoming API consumers. And some APIs may be internal APIs, some may be external APIs I'm consuming. Exactly. So, and, and that, that ties together with uh, a telco industry terminology, uh, which is this concept of northbound, southbound, and westbound, and eastbound. Uh, and and this, uh, this terminology in the telco in industry means, northbound means things that the consumers are using, southbound means going back into the core systems. So, so similarly here, uh, the way we are, we are advocating to use these terms is, uh, uh, you know, that north means you are exposing it to the external universe beyond the business. Uh, on the left-hand side or the west boundary means you are exposing it to the internal organization. So calls can come in from that side, from within the organization. And that represents basically the capabilities that you are giving out for other people to consume. But then you also consume other people's capabilities. That's the whole point because if nobody consumes uh, stuff, it's not going to work. It's a whole, whole point of uh, API and service architecture is this economy of services being consumed, new services being produced. So when we consume, if we are consuming something from outside the organization, we can consider that a southbound invocation. And when you're cons consuming something from inside the organization, you can consider that an eastbound invocation. And that conceptual model then gives you a way to think about what are the things that you are going to, uh, you know, what, what is your architecture in terms of the interface of that entire organization. Got it. Yeah, I think uh, you remind me one thing about the cell architecture as well that we uh, touch based on a previous episode that definitely we will do a detailed uh, discussion about it in a future. Uh, episode. Uh, so, the, if uh, uh, we are using cell-based architecture, it gives a nice model uh, to manage this uh, uh, northbound, southbound, west and eastbound uh, communication as well. And I think uh, that's another uh, kind of uh, confusion is about the gateways and uh, where to use the API gateways and how they can uh, communicate it. And I saw like uh, with your chief product officer hat, uh, you were having uh, multiple conversations about this with the uh, product teams. Um, uh, can you kind of a uh, little bit touch base yeah. on that part as well? Yeah, I, I think, I think it, 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 you know, a gateway, an API gateway is the, um, is the security guard or the enforcing authority in the universe of API management. So when you talk about API management, it's basically about who can consume, what are the properties or the rates or the limits that you can use and variety of other things that you want to do, various policies you want to implement and so on. Uh, but then somebody's got to be the enforcer, the policy enforcement point for these things, which is the gateway. right? So then the question becomes, well, is every service invocation within a business, should it go through a gateway? Uh, and of course, the... Uh, from a very pure abstract um, uh, point of view, you could say, well, yeah, if you have something in the middle, you have the opportunity to intercept, to monitor, to trace, to count, to build, do all kinds of stuff. But at the same time, there is always a cost. There's no, you know, uh, no pain, with, uh, uh, no gain without some pain. And the cost is latency. Every time you flip through something else, there is some implied cost. Um, so you don't necessarily want to say everything I call within the business goes through a gateway. Uh, certainly, if you are exposing stuff to the internet, you must obviously go through a gateway and manage full security and do all kinds of things to DDoS prevention, to things so forth, right? Yeah. And if you don't you want, do that, somebody will put a gateway for you. Yeah. Somebody will put a gateway for you, basically, yeah. is yeah. what's going to happen, right? The, the other part is within the organization, especially in large organizations, you can't really assume that one business unit's capability is being used by another business unit's capabilities are any different than somebody using an external service, right? So then again, you need an API management infrastructure. So, so in our parlance, we usually say you need an internal API gateway and an external API gateway from that perspective, right? Uh, and then calls within your sort of friends and family, so to speak, 
you know, I trust you, you trust me, so you let me call you, basically, right? And and it happens. So, uh, but of course, that doesn't mean you don't want to know what's going on, uh, you know, from a system operational perspective. You do want to know what's going on, and that's where we lead on to um, more modern, uh, something that has come up fairly recently, which allows you to implement that, uh, that kind of behavior. So maybe we should start talking first about sidecasts uh, and mm-hmm. then come to eBPF and, uh, and things because that might give some context, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, when, when, when we start, when the Kubernetes uh, uh, container uh, era got going, uh, there was this concept called sidecar that came along. Uh, it, it's not a, a, the word sidecar, by the way, comes from the thing that you can attach to a motorbike. Mm. If you Google sidecar and motorbike, you will see pictures of it. Uh, the, the thing where there was another car you could attach, there was a second wheel and it was like balanced on one bar and somebody could sit on it and the motorbike guy can give you a ride essentially, right? Mm. I think heavily uh, used during World War One or Two. Or yeah, World War Two, I think. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was exactly right. So mm-hmm. side guy could be a gunner, could be you know whatever, it could be a boss getting a ride, you know whatever it was. Um, and and the point was the side car is always there. You know this guy turns left, side side car turns left, turns right. You know starts, stops, everything's there. The same architecture concept in Kubernetes. In a Kubernetes pod, you can have any number of containers. Right? And each container, and there's a primary container, and the others are sidecars. And the sidecars uh, are, are typically set up with network level interception capabilities. So, so service meshes, uh, Istio in particular, uh, was a sidecar based service mesh where it would intercept all network messages going in and out. And because it's a level two intercept, it's very efficient. Um, and the sidecar was then able to route. And in fact, Envoy Proxy was being used for that purpose. Uh, and then there was a separate protocol to talk to the sidecar, right? The problem with sidecars, and if you've tried Istio, you know this, is of course that it's very expensive. For every pod I have, for every container, I have a corresponding container. So when the pod auto scales to 200 pods, you now have 400 containers instead of 200, right? Uh, and over the... Uh, over the last several years, actually, I'm not sure exactly when eBPF came. eBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter or Enhanced Berkeley Packet Filter. I can't remember. Enhanced, yeah. Yeah. enhanced I think. Yeah. Uh, which is basically a way to intercept system calls in the operating system and allow some code to run against that. Right? It's like an event handling architecture for system calls. Uh, I'm sure somebody who's an eBPF expert mm-hmm. is going to, uh, you know, is cringing at that definition. But... Uh, conceptual level, that's what it lets you do. Uh, and what eBPF allows then needs to, so let's say I have a Java program running, I have a Python program running, a Go program running, a Ballerina program running in a container. With eBPF, I'm one level below all of that. I'm at the system call interface level. I can intercept all network traffic. I can intercept DNS lookup. I can intercept whatever I want and inject capabilities into that into that environment. Uh, so eBPF then be, essentially can be used as an observer, a lightweight observer. So because even for internal service calls, we want to know who's calling me, what's the, how often am I being called and things like that. If you don't have a gateway, you have no information, right? There's a piece of code, somebody's calling it over the network. Who, what time did they call it? Well, who called it? How many times has it been called? This is useful information. So you know what, what the load characteristics, how you want to scale it and things like that. Uh, so eBPF, and then if you combine with MTLS, uh, the, uh, that gives you the ability to then become a minimalistic observer, right? And there's a product called Cilium, which uh, we are actually using in Corio now, which is a combination which allows you to build this kind of capabilities using eBPF and MTLS and so on. So you can do uh, set up MTLS, you can support zero trust networking. Um, uh, capabilities and then by combining that data you, you now get a certain level of observability into service invocations without having an API gateway a full scale API gateway which is a network hop exactly I think uh, eBPF is going to be a game changer because uh, it's providing uh, the it's communication efficiency as well as the security that we required 
and then uh, the organization um, uh, they, they don't have to uh, get into this complicated service mesh type of implementations uh, uh, with uh, consuming eBPF and that will uh, be really helpful. Uh, I think it's a very interesting conversation Sanjeeva, so I think we covered a lot. Uh, so thanks everybody uh, and uh, we will catch you in another episode with another interesting topic. Thank you.